God is so crazy good. He really is. I, <laughs> I asked Ed to give me what he, the word he gave. He had it written down, I noticed. Um, because uh, it's really what God wanted to share with us this morning. It's crazy. I, I hear that coming out and I'm going, yikes. So I want to just read a little of it. He says, uh, he talked about creative miracles. He says, the, the picture he got was someone getting knocked off a horse. If you were thrown off or sidetracked, if you have fear, guilt, or shame, if you have stuff coming against you, come and sit at my table. The Lord says, I welcome you to come to a table of creative miracles. Let me restore your vision, your level of faith. Let me fill your ears with the sound of promise. I just want to be with you. I want you to think of that word as um, I talk about what I felt like the Lord gave me this morning to talk about because um, it's an amazing time. It's an amazing time of year. I uh, think about Easter. I, uh, my, my mind kept going back to all of this whole week, Easter, and all that was accomplished and all the things that happened, and we're going to look at some of them this morning. I, I just need to pray again, Lord. Just um, do your thing this morning, I pray, that none of our stuff would get in the way. Father, would you open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive. The Holy Spirit, would you come? We just love you so much. Amen. Okay, we've been going through, we've started, as you know, the, a study in the book of Acts, and we're going to kind of continue that this morning. I love it because really what we're looking at today is goes along with um, where we would have been back with the first Easter. Um, you know, Jesus has, uh, has been tried and convicted wrongly. Um, all of his disciples ran away. It just wasn't what they thought they signed up for. And they were really afraid. They were thrown off the horse. Um, they had shame afterwards when Jesus rose from the dead and he met with them. Can you just imagine how they must have felt when he came to them? It's like, shoot. I, I'm so sorry, Lord. You know, and, and, and so as we were, as I was thinking about this word this week, all of that kind of kept coming back to me. And so I want to start Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. I don't know why I opened my Bible, because it's right here. And it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I think to really understand what's happening, we do have to go back. We have to go back to Easter. We have to look see what, what, what the disciples had hoped for and then when Jesus died how their hopes were really dashed. And then he raises from the dead and now he calls them together for the last time just before he ascends to the Father. In Matthew 28 he says this and I love this. He says now, Matthew's describing what happened. He says now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And then I love the next three words. But some doubted. 
And I'm just thinking, Matthew, why would you put that in there? Those words, but some doubted. Do you see how this may be uh, the disciples were, might have been feeling at this time? It's like, okay, now he raised from the dead, and now, okay, all those things we hoped for, now he's going to do. Luke actually says at one point, he says, they said to him, is it now that you're going to establish your kingdom? So they still didn't quite get it, right? And so Matthew puts in here some doubt. Do you see, I think that Jesus had already told them, hey, I'm going to go away going to go back to my father in heaven and now what I was sent to do I give to you that you're to complete the work that I began could you imagine that he says that to you right after you completely deny him right after you mess up could you imagine Jesus coming to you and going hey Don um Look, I got this thing I need you to do. Um, And I'm just going, wait a minute, Lord. You realize I just said I didn't even know you? I just acted like you didn't exist? Uh, How could you ask me to do something like that? I can't do it. I've already proven to you. That's why when you prayed that, every time I get up here, it's like, and, I, and really, it's, um, anybody that knows me knows that I just have a hard time with this. I doubt. Um, I don't understand how God could use a person like me. I just don't. And so I think that's what the disciples were feeling. Some doubted. Just 40 days earlier, they were running away. In Mark 14, 50, it says that they all left him and fled. Here they'd been with him for three years. They'd seen everything he'd done. They heard all of his teaching. And then when this happens, they run away. They fall off the horse. And now Jesus has come back to them. And he's saying, hey, um, I'm going to be going again. This time I'm going to be gone for a while, but I'm entrusting you with my mission. I'm entrusting you with my mission, with the most important thing on God's heart. I'm entrusting you with it. The number one thing on God's heart, reconciling people to him, He's entrusting you with it. Oh my goodness. He doesn't know me very well, does he? 40 days before they turn tail and run. I'm guessing that they're wondering what's this going to be like? How are we ever going to do this? Some doubted. I remember um, a time in my life where God had used me. Um, for a period of time and then uh, another short period of time happened where pretty much I just denied him in the same way the disciples did and I really messed up and I remember the thoughts and the feelings that I had I was completely distraught I just thought, God, you could never, ever, ever use me again. As a matter of fact, I doubt that you could ever forgive me for what I did. And for probably three months, I was in that place of utter fear, of being so disappointed in myself and knowing that God was disappointed in me and believing that, Lord, if you just not send me to hell, I don't care if you ever use me again, but please, would you just do your best to forgive me? And that's how I felt. I never had any thoughts of doing anything for him because I knew how badly I had disappointed him. And I think this is what Matthew is pointing out with those three little words. 
I mean, I can relate to it. I don't know if you can. Maybe you've kind of done the same. Maybe not as bad as I did, but maybe you fell off the horse and you have shame or you have guilt or you have fear. I think they felt all of those things and that is why they doubted. I'm a flawed guy. I know my thoughts, I know the things I struggle with, I know the motives that I, that I, I try to keep pure. I know me inside better than anyone but he knows me. And I can fool most people most of the time, but I know that his eyes are on me and he sees me for who I am. Every little point, I cannot hide from him. No matter where we are, no matter what we think, no matter how well we think it's hidden, we have a loving father who looks down with his loving eyes and sees his children. And it's not that you anger him, it's that he aches for you. Because he says, oh, that's not what I created you for. You're, you're buying into something that's literally destroying you. Imagine if you have a child and you're watching as they are literally destroying themselves. That's how he feels about me. So I know me and I quite honestly, I shake my head in dis disbelief that I could be of any value to God that he really could use me in any way. So I think that's where the disciples are. He's gonna leave them, he's going back to heaven. And he's commissioning them now, take on my ministry of reconciliation, I'm leaving it in your hands. Carry on the hope that I have. Talk about the forgiveness that I have. And I think they kind of wondered, can we really do it? So I love what comes next. This is what's so cool. Look at Acts um, chapter one, verse six through eight. Again, it's talking about the same event. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of heaven? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed, uh, that, that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And he goes on to say, see, he knows their doubt. He knows their fear. He knows their shame. It's not hidden. So what, look what he does. He goes on to say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in, Judea, in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. Some doubted. Don't doubt. You see, you're gonna receive power to do what I've called you to do. It's coming. Seriously? He makes this promise. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now he says, go back and wait for it. I love verse eight. He's commissioning them. He's, he's laying out their marching orders. Three things he talks about, it, just this one little verse. And I will tell you that this one little verse describes perfectly what Acts is all about. If everything goes through the filter of verse eight, look what he says, three things. He says, you're gonna receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We see the purpose for the Holy Spirit coming, and we see the plan, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises you'll receive power to do what you're doubting that you'll be able to do. He tells him he's gonna send his Holy Spirit to be with them and in them. And then he gives them the purpose for the Holy Spirit, and catch this, guys, this is so important. This is the purpose he sends the Holy Spirit. He says, to be my witness. 
that's it. He's sending the Holy Spirit to empower you to do what you don't think you can do, which is be his witness. That's all. And then the plan is you're going to have power. You'll be able to be my witness. That's what I'm telling you to do. I'm asking you to do. And now go and do it. That's why the Holy Spirit came. There's a mission that Jesus has given us. It's not to sit here and feel good. It isn't. It's not to sit here and feel good. The Holy Spirit came so you would have power to be his witness. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. I love this. So when it happens, you're gonna have power that you're gonna need to accomplish what he's calling you to do. You're gonna have power over doubt, power over fear, power over shame. There's gonna be a boldness that would come upon you, a boldness that compels you to go and share. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's interesting how people view the Holy Spirit. And I think there are essentially like two camps that people view the Holy Spirit. One of them is they, they diminish the importance of the Holy Spirit. They kind of downplay the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit kind of makes them nervous. Um, I don't want to be weird. So I just want enough of that, you know, to feel good, but I don't want to do any of those weird things that that happen when the Holy Spirit is around. You see, the Holy Spirit is a wind that blows anywhere he wants. That's how the Bible describes him. And so, yikes, I'm kind of comfortable keeping him here. I'll concentrate on Jesus and the Father. So that's one camp. And then there's a second one. The second group kind of overemphasizes the Holy Spirit. It's all about the Holy Spirit. They want to elevate the Spirit to a place that minimizes the Father and the Son and makes the Holy Spirit the whole point. This group tends to elevate experience of the supernatural as being the main point. They're the ones that Jesus, or I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit's kind of the party animal part of God, right? That's the part of God that just likes to get down and funky and do weird things. He's like, he's the one that passes out the wine so everybody can get drunk. Really, that's the Holy Spirit. So God brought us the Holy Spirit so that we could experience that kind of stuff. It's all about miracles. It's all about the supernatural. And so they get really elevate the Holy Spirit to a place that the Holy Spirit, quite honestly, though he may do some of those things, the purpose for him doing it is not the purpose for which you seek him to do it. Does that make sense? The purpose for him doing it is not the purpose for which you seek him to do it. If, in doing it, it brings somebody to a place where they are reconciled with the Father, he will do it. If it's for you to party, I don't think so. It's not what it says. Now, do parties happen? When the Holy Spirit came, people said, they are just drunk. They're just drunk, and a phenomenon happened that had never happened. Suddenly, these men start speaking, and women start speaking in languages that they didn't know. We're not talking about a heavenly language. We're talking about, you know I took Russian. I shared that a few weeks ago. I'm not the brightest. 
but it would be like me getting up here and beginning to speak in perfect Russian. I've already told you, I've pretty much flunked it. It was grace that I got to move on. So this is what started happening. See, life in the church is not just supposed to be a big party, guys, where we get together and we go, I just want more of the Holy Spirit, which means I just want some weird stuff to happen. I have so many people that over my life that have said to me, I just want a church that has more Holy Spirit. And here's what I hear them saying. I want a church where the Holy Spirit comes and empowers us as witnesses to go out and win the lost. That's what I hear them saying. That's not what many of them are saying. I want a church where I can come and watch some really weird, cool stuff happen and get all excited about it and go and talk to everybody about how the Holy Spirit fell on us. You should have seen it, we all looked drunk. For what? Why? Why would the Holy Spirit do that? And so when we're talking more about, I want more of the Holy Spirit, I hope what we as a church are saying is, I want to be so empowered by the Holy Spirit that everywhere I go, people are meeting Christ because they've met me. That's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's why he came. No other reason. Jesus says, look, you guys doubt? I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And when he comes on you, you're not gonna doubt anymore. You're not gonna fear anymore. You're not gonna be in shame anymore. You're gonna proclaim this message I came to proclaim and people are going to be reconciled to the Father. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what I want here. It isn't just singing long enough where something weird happens. It's worshiping the Father for what he's done and crying out, Father, empower me to be a witness for you. Empower me. And so I love the scripture that says, as they went, miracles happened. Why? Because they needed them to. But can I tell you that miracles in and of themselves, they just don't last. I, uh, they have no staying power. Uh, and some of you will say, no, no, Don, I disagree. I'm okay with you disagreeing. But here's the deal. I, I, I've seen miracles happen. And then I've seen people just go back to everything they used to do the same way. Uh, let's look at one. Um, so Moses comes up to the Red Sea. And it's like, here comes Pharaoh and all his armies. We're sunk. Stick your staff in the water, step out into the water, boom. <sighs> dry land. Now, that's cool. That's cool. I'm going to talk about that one, right? And we would think that that will last forever. I will never forget that. That's where God showed up. That was cool, I'm forever changed. A couple weeks later, what are they doing? They're melting their gold and they form a golden calf to worship. Sometimes miracles are great, but they have no staying power. When my dad got healed, um, I've talked to you about when he was basically raised from the dead and got healed and there was, a, there was a boy next to him in the bed next to him who had taken a gun and had, um, played Russian roulette and he lost and blew out the top of his brain. And his mom asked me when, when she knew we were gonna meet with the doctors about pulling the plug on my dad, she says, can I be there? Because I know I'm gonna probably go through that as well and I just wanna know what I'm gonna expect, need to be expecting. She had been told that he has 0% chance of survival. So the next day when my dad is singing and talking, She was blown away. She said, will you pray for my son? I said, yeah, I will. She says, well, when? I said, when I feel like the Lord would have me do that. And so one day, just like the next day, I'm sitting with my dad and we're talking and I feel the Spirit say, now. 
So I walked around the curtain and I looked at her and she looked at me and she, the doctor was examining her son and, and she says, now? I said, yeah. So she grabs the doctor, she says, come on, we're going, he's gonna pray for my son. The, the doctor wasn't happy. And so I pray for her son, I actually just kind of speak a word over him that I felt like the Lord wanted me to speak. And then I walked out into the hall and she says, well, I said, we'll see. I went back to the hospital two weeks later to see how this young man was doing and the girl at the desk goes, Don, that was the weirdest week around here. First your dad and this kid. I go, where is he? And she says, he's at another hospital and he's going to recover 100%. It was amazing, right? It would change anyone's life, right? This kid, his family, all of them would go, okay, tell me more about this God, right? Wrong. I walked into the kid's room and I looked at him and I said, so, tell me what happened? And he says, well, I was, did something stupid. Uh, I was in the bathroom and I saw this revolver and he says, I thought I'd try and see what it was like to play Russian roulette. And I'm gonna quote him, please don't be offended. He said, I pulled the trigger, and as the gun went off, I thought, oh shit. Now let me tell you something that I learned when I was in the hospital. The frontal lobes of your brain are where your short-term memory is. They were gone. Yet he remembered, remember the word creative miracles? He remembered up to the second when the gun went off. He's not supposed to be able to do that. God completely healed him. And here's what they said afterwards. And when he gets out of here, we are gonna party like we've never partied. Not once did they say, thanks for praying. See, now that he was healed, their problems were over and they could go on with life again. The miraculous cannot sustain you. I guarantee you. And so what's happening, I think, sometimes in the, in the church, when we think about the Holy Spirit, is we're trying to be sustained by those things, rather than have a deeper walk with God, where the things we don't understand, we still trust him. We, we don't want those things, and so we, we proclaim against them. And yet the Bible says, you're gonna have those things, and quite honestly, you're gonna have them for purpose. But we don't want that. I want the Holy Spirit to come and move and remove it and have victory and, okay. But God says, I wanna I want train you. I wanna teach you. I wanna mature you and, and raise you up. And I wanna empower you to change the world. Two ways we look at the Holy Spirit. And I think that both of those are dangerous. The purpose or the reason that the Father is sending the Holy Spirit to us is to empower us to be his witness. Not just to feel good. The Holy Spirit was sent to clothe you with power so that you can be his witness. And so let me just show, share with you how you know you have that. People are getting saved when they're around you. If you want more of the Holy Spirit, then what you're saying is, I want the boldness and the love and the compassion and I want shame removed and fear removed so that I, when I meet people, they'll see God in me and they will want him and I will share with them boldly. And, and then if for some reason God needs to do something in order for that to happen, like heal them, he will. See, that's the purpose for those things. The purpose for all that the Holy Spirit has is to bring honor and glory to God so that they will be reconciled to him. Is that how you see the Holy Spirit? I, I, this is amazing when I look at Easter and I look at all that happened and I look at the honesty of Matthew when he says we doubted and Jesus says don't doubt see I'm going to empower you to do 
the very thing I've called you to do. And what he's called you to do is to be his witnesses to the world, that all the world would be saved. He would that none would perish, but that all would come to life in him. And I, I don't, I don't want to be critical, but church, is that how we see it? Are we so consumed with the Holy Spirit that I am compelled that no matter what happens, I am compelled to do what he called me to do. This is what happened to Paul. This is why he can go through beating after beating after beating, imprisonment after imprisonment, close to death a number of times and get up and keep doing it. See, he didn't pray, deliver me from the rocks being thrown at me. He said, Father, glorify your name. Glorify your name. And then, when he was still alive, he goes, still got breath. I'm good to go. I'm gonna do what God has called me to do, and that is proclaim this message that he's entrusted me with. See, that's what it is to be filled with the Spirit. Again, please hear me, I'm not saying, as some have accused me, I'm a cessationist, I am not. Cessationist means you believe that those things ended with the death of the apostles, if you don't know what that word means. That miracles no longer happen. I say they do. I say God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we should pray for the sick, why? Because he said, pray for the sick. And I'm gonna trust him to do whatever he does. But I'm gonna pray. The gifts are amazing. But if you look throughout scripture, when the gifts are talked about, do you know how they're usually talked about? People are being corrected about their use of them. Corinthians, that's what Paul's doing. He's not saying do these things, he's saying hey, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. When you do these things, do it this way. So he's not saying they don't happen, he's saying they do, but yeah, you're kind of putting an emphasis where it was never intended to be. That's how the gifts are talked about in scripture. I hope I'm not stepping on too many toes. I want to see the Holy Spirit move. I want him to move in power in our church. Oh, that we would be bold and not doubt. That we would share the love of Jesus. That we would see people reconciled. Look around and think about this. If each one of you in one year led one person to the Lord and committed yourself to discipling them, we'd have to put in more chairs. It's not about how many of you are here in one sense for me, because I love the ones that are here. But if we are the same size next year, we've missed it. Okay, it's just honest. I'm gonna be honest, just the same way that Matthew was when he said they doubted, I'm gonna say, if we're the same size next year, if next year you cannot raise your hand and say, I'm discipling this person that I led to the Lord, then you need to pray for the Holy Spirit to empower you. That's what you need to do. Because that's why Jesus said he came, to give you power to be his witness. That's what it's about. Don't give him a place that he was never intended to have. But don't you dare minimize him either. The Holy Spirit is a gift that we were given. And so when they came together, Lord, you're gonna establish your kingdom. He says, ah, it's not for you to know that, but here's what you need to know. You're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness. You no longer have to doubt it. 
You no longer have to walk in fear. You no longer have to walk in shame. If you don't know him, one of the things that keeps people from God is shame and fear and doubt. He'll remove it. He'll remove every bit of it. I still struggle sometimes believing that, but I get up here every time I'm asked. Guys, God wants to use you. He he doesn't just want to save you. He wants to use you. You have a mission. He's given you the power. He's given you the purpose, and he's given you the plan. Now, we get to say yes or no, as a church and as individuals. He's given us all that we need. I am praying for me right now, because sometimes I think that though I'm trying to get out and and meet people that don't know the Lord, I still don't have the boldness and the power that I need to lead them to a relationship of reconciliation with the Father. It's not about being a church, guys. There's a million churches, probably more than that, but figure speech. They're all being churches. I don't wanna be just a church. I wanna be people on mission for God. And I hope that you will join in that. This isn't about whether you like me or Carl or this or that or, I hear so many people talk about the church and what they don't like. And I can understand you not liking Carl. (laughs) (laughs) He's gonna hear that too. (laughs) But listen, this is about our mission. It's about our call. It's not just about being saved. And so I'm asking you to look again at why the Holy Spirit was given on that day of Pentecost, just 50 days after Jesus died. 10 days, they waited. Jesus says, go and wait. For 10 days, they met together and they waited for the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what it was they were waiting for. But when it showed up, when he showed up, they knew it. Okay, never heard that kind of wind before and check out your new hairdo. (laughs) Wow. And all of a sudden we start talking in languages we don't know, but here's, what do they call it? Here's a teaser. And you can read on. Look what happened after the Holy Spirit came. Directly after, I want you to look at what happens next. I think Carl may talk about it next week. Okay? So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you confirm your word. I thank you that you gave Ed this prophetic word. Lord, that that you've raised men and women in this congregation up to hear your word, to hear you speak, and that your word was the same that you spoke through Ed as what you spoke to me this week. I'm amazed at you. And so Lord, I I pray that we as a church, we as individuals would listen today and throughout this week to the word that you spoke this morning. Lord, that we would see the Holy Spirit for who he is, that we would understand the commission that you've given us and that we would not again, ever again, ignore that, but that you would keep it on the forefront of our mind as a body of believers, that we would be about sharing the amazing love you have sharing about how you and you alone can break the chains of sin and the junk that so easily binds us up and keeps us in that place where we hate to be. Lord, would you do that in us? Holy Spirit, would you come? 
would you fall on us as a congregation in a way God that we know that we're forever changed that we are compelled to do what your Holy Spirit came to do thank you Lord so as we sing this song I just want your prayer to be right where you're sitting if you have heard this word that you would ask him Holy Spirit, would you fall on me today? Maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe, maybe you've just kind of said, ah, I don't like religion and I don't like church and I don't like organized whatever, but you don't know him. Can I tell you, I encourage you to just say, Holy Spirit, would you show me who you are and who the Father is? Would you fall on me today? And so that's what I hope our prayer will be as we sing this song.